Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Edmund Schuster, Associate Professor of Corporate Law at the London School of Economics. We'll be discussing his article, Cloud Crypto Land, which is forthcoming in the Modern Law Review. I'll have a link to the article in the show notes for the episode. Edmund, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Hi, Andrew. Thank you very much for having me. Edmund, for listeners who aren't immersed in the world of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, some probably are, but others probably are not, could you give us some background or a high-level overview of just what cryptocurrency and blockchain are, where do they come from, and how do they work? Absolutely. So in its current form, most cryptocurrencies and blockchain protocols, they can be traced back to this Bitcoin white paper. This is a document that was posted online pseudonymously using the name Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008. In this Bitcoin white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto, and we still don't know who that is, if this is one person or a group of people, this is still a big mystery. They posted this Bitcoin white paper and in it they describe and also provide an implementation of a protocol that allows for some cash-like electronic assets that can be traded directly between users. So it can be traded peer-to-peer without the need for any central record keeper or intermediary. Just to try and map this onto concepts that may be a bit more familiar to lawyers, we can look at physical assets and contrast them with the world of intangibles or or really any registered rights or anything like that, including, for instance, contractual rights, the right to receive a payment or something. We can, of course, always transfer physical assets directly between ourselves. So let's say I have an apple and I give it to you. So as I hand the apple to you, obviously you just have it and we call this possession. And obviously that's very meaningful in itself because once you have the apple, the legal systems of countries pretty much everywhere in the world and for a very, very long time have given very special status to having possession over an item just because it's so useful and in at least the simple circumstances, it's fairly unambiguous. Now, if we look at intangibles instead, so let's take the right to receive a payment. We can, of course, also transfer such rights in a peer-to-peer fashion. So I can say, I don't know, the rental payment that my tenant owes to me, I will assign that to you. But we do run into a bit of a problem here because we need to trust each other a bit. The mere fact that I say I want to assign this right to you doesn't really offer you any assurance that first kind of the right exists in the first place, but also that I haven't already transferred it to somebody else before assigning it to you. And it's really the second problem that poses the biggest challenge for anything like electronic cash here. And this is called the double spending problem. So from a high level, we can look at this and say, if we are talking about assets that are not physical, any intangible, any contractual right, anything like that, then we can transfer them directly between ourselves. But then there needs to be a bit of trust between us. We could also do away with the need to have trust in each other. And in order to do so, we would have to appoint somebody as the kind of central record keeper. We could, for instance, have a rule that says only transfers that are registered with the registrar are valid. And then we don't really need to trust each other anymore because the fact that the registrar has the right or other asset recorded as belonging to me And me giving the instruction to the registrar to transfer it to you gives you the guarantee that you actually receive what you contracted for. And that will even be true if you believe that I'm not trustworthy and that I am the kind of person who would try, for instance, to transfer the same right twice. The last option would be to somehow tie something that is intangible in itself to some physical object and then just pretend that the physical object itself is a full representation of 
the intangible asset in question. And we do all three of these things, really. So sometimes in, in many circumstances, we are perfectly happy going ahead with just trusting each other when we, for instance, assign rights. In some cases, and this really has applications beyond just intangibles, we do that in many countries in relation to land, for instance. We have a central record keeper and we say, you know, possession is not terribly useful and sometimes not very meaningful in relation to land. And so we say, Maybe it's useful to have some central record keeper. We do that in England. We do that in, in many continental European countries where sometimes we even say, you know, the only way of transferring property rights in land is by going through the central record keeper. And we give some special status to the state of the record kept by our registrar. And in the article, I also describe how this third type of transferring these rights came about. And this is, of course, kind of the history of the negotiable instrument. So at some point in the Middle Ages, merchants realized that it would be really useful to be able to transfer rights of some sort between themselves without having to worry about these things. And so what they did was they wrote something down on a piece of paper and then they proceeded, obviously I'm, I'm simplifying a bit, but they proceeded with kind of transferring the pieces of paper between themselves and just pretending that the piece of paper is a full embodiment of whatever it is supposed to represent. Now, if we move to the world of digital assets, we have one problem that is very similar to the problems I just described. And that problem is that every digital asset, every digital representation of anything is necessarily non-unique. And that's actually good. So when we talk about somebody stealing a movie or something like that, obviously we don't mean that in the same way that we could say somebody stole an apple. Because the mere fact that somebody has a digital representation, for instance, of, I don't know, of some movie, doesn't actually restrict the access of the original holder or owner of that asset. That's a very useful thing about digital assets, that they are non-unique. They consist of um, zeros and ones, basically, and they can be copied. If I sent my article to you and then I followed up with another email saying, you know, Andrew, please send me my article back. I sent you the wrong version. You would probably think that I'm slightly confused because obviously me having sent the article to you doesn't restrict my access to it in the first place. But what that also means for digital assets is that it's really hard to transfer them in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion if we want exclusive access to these digital assets. So the way this works really is by saying we need a central record keeper. We need somebody who records, who has access, who has the entitlement to a digital asset. And then we can trade these digital assets through a central record keeper. And there's nothing special or surprising about that. But that is not an equivalent to cash in a way, because cash, obviously, I can hand you a $10 bill or something like that, and you then have that cash, and we don't need to go for a central record key. So how can you replicate that in the digital world? And then this is not a trivial problem to solve. And so the Bitcoin white paper, building on a number of innovations in this space, defines this protocol that basically allows us to do this. Now, the technical details are somewhat complicated and perhaps even not all that important. But what the protocol allows us to do is to have a digital asset that can be transferred in a similar way to, let's say, a piece of paper that embodies a right or embodies some entitlement. So it allows us to use digital assets in the same way that we could use a physical object. And once we have this kind of technology in place, we can then, of course, say, well, if the protocol really does allow us to trade those digital assets in the same way as physical objects, and that mainly means that we can solve the problem of double spending, if I transfer this digital asset to you, I will no longer be able to transfer the same digital asset to somebody else. So if I can establish this exclusivity, then I can use this digital asset in a similar way that I could use cash. So when I 
talk to my students about this, I say it's comparable to a situation where somebody invents a great new fax machine, where this fax machine has this added novel feature that when I send the fax to you, you can be absolutely sure that my original has been irretrievably shredded or something like that. Now, if such a machine existed, we could say, well, couldn't we then just use it to fax banknotes between ourselves? Because once I send a banknote to you, if you can be and if everyone can be absolutely sure that this automatically and reliably means that I no longer have the banknote, then we could, obviously this is a slightly unrealistic example, but we could then say, you know, Edmund faxing a banknote to Andrew is so reliable in its destruction of the original banknote and the receipt of the banknote on your end that we should now just proceed on the basis that faxed banknotes, so whatever you receive on the other end, is equivalent, is indistinguishable, should have the same value as the original banknote that I had. So this is what the Bitcoin white paper describes, a protocol for achieving this. The way it achieves that is by using concepts that have long existed in cryptography and putting them together in a fairly clever and novel way. And this protocol is counterintuitive in a way that most cryptography applications are. I always, again, when I teach this stuff, I try to explain this to students by asking them how likely they believe it is to, you know, shuffle a deck of kind of a deck of cards that you would use for poker with 52 cards. If you shuffle that properly, how likely is it that somebody else will also shuffle his or her deck of cards and end up with the same order of cards? And so when I ask this question, the intuition of most people is that is pretty unlikely and probably will only happen once once a year, or it's a one in a million chance or something like that. But if you actually look at this and, and work it through, you can calculate that it's just mind-bogglingly unrealistic. So it's something like if every star in the observable universe had a planet with 8 billion people on it, and these 8 billion people each had a supercomputer shuffling decks of cards starting at the Big Bang and continuing up until today, we would still not expect collisions now. Something like that, right? And so it's this property of cryptography that you have fairly small, discrete things like, you know, the order of a deck of cards. And in cryptography, it would be a string of letters and digits that can be permutated in so many different ways that you can do things that you don't necessarily expect. The big downside or one big downside of the protocol is that it is very determined, it's very committed to not creating any superior, any central privileged counterparty or record keeper. And in order to achieve that, in a world where we want everyone to be able to participate in the system without any identity checks or anything like that, so anyone can participate in the system on an equal basis, in order to make this work, the protocol requires us to solve fairly pointless puzzles. And solving these puzzles is referred to as mining and Bitcoin. And there's obviously a lot of discussion about the energy cost of mining Bitcoin and more generally the environmental impact of using this technology. So this is the origin of it. The most important and most talked about implementation of that is the original implementation, this implementation of Bitcoin, where what we have is in a way a ledger that records who has how many coins and we can transact in those coins and all of that works without anyone running the network, without anyone keeping the record. That's the key implementation that we've seen to date. But outside of this technology being used for decentralized currency systems, what applications have been suggested for blockchain or distributed ledger technology? And what's been the enthusiasm out there for blockchain applications? If you look at decentralized currencies or so Bitcoin and comparable cryptocurrencies, then the advantage of these implementations is that in a way nothing in the real world has to happen 
in order to give effect to what we want to achieve. So what I mean by that is if I transfer bitcoins to you, the bitcoins do not stand in, they do not represent anything outside of the protocol. They are just bitcoins. So when I transfer them to you and the transfer is complete under the rules of the protocol, that's just it. But it's perhaps not surprising that when people looked at this system and in a way looked at it as being very similar to the kind of the development of the Lex Mercatoria and the development of the, the negotiable instrument, they said, well, what we have here really is a system for trading kind of like pieces of paper between ourselves. And if we have this system, then couldn't we do what the merchants in the Middle Ages came up with and just write all sorts of stuff on the pieces of papers and then just trade something else that we will treat as being embodied by the token, the coin, the piece of paper in, in a way and use blockchain technology for you know, trading whatever we want to trade or transferring or recording whatever we want to transfer. And so the enthusiasm for blockchain technology outside committed cryptocurrency advocates is centered around the question whether we can use the technology to trade other assets. The, perhaps the clearest example would be to say, wouldn't it be a good idea to just have our shares, shares of a corporation recorded on a blockchain and then tokenized, meaning that we just do something that is very similar to Bitcoin. But now we say each coin represents, let's say, one share in the company. And then suddenly we can trade those shares between ourselves in a similar fashion that you could trade bearer shares that are physically present in the form of a share certificate in the physical world. But we can now do it electronically. And importantly, we can do that without having any share registrar for it. And there are other uses. There are some people who have suggested using it for recording land ownership and all sorts of additional possible applications that really any anyone can think of. Whenever I try to come up with some particularly silly theoretical application of blockchain technology and then Google it, it turns out that somebody has actually tried to implement it for this way. In addition to simply transferring assets that we want to treat as being represented by a token or a coin, there has also been a lot of discussion around so-called smart contracts. The idea here is that because we are now not talking about just, in a way, dumb pieces of paper, but electronic assets that can implement some additional functionality, we could also use blockchain technology to, in a way, encode agreements between two parties. So it would, for instance, be possible, in principle at least, to have an agreement, let's say it's a simple bond or something like that, and the idea would be to have the token that represents the bond not just represent this abstract promise of payment in the future, but also implement a piece of computer code that in itself can execute under certain conditions once a certain date has arrived or using some other triggers that will then change the state of that token and will trigger some other action. So we would then have kind of a small computer program and the hope that this would be a replacement of costly normal written legal contract that would then be implemented in code form and embedded in the protocol that we use for transferring assets. In the paper, you suggest that we might need to curb our enthusiasm when it comes to non-currency applications of blockchain or uh, smart contracts as well. Some of these things that people have been very enthusiastic about. Why is that? My high level answer to that is to just note that blockchain technology the, the real innovation that we have here is the full decentralization. And as I said earlier, creating a system where anyone can participate in the system on kind of an equal basis. That there is no hierarchy in the system, in a way. And I explain in the paper that there's 
this fundamental mismatch between that and our general commitment to the rule of law. Because the rule of law requires a certain hierarchy. If it's not just that nobody's above the law, but it's also that the law is above us so that our interactions are governed by the law. And so to be more concrete about the problems that I identify and describe in the article, there are a number of very simple scenarios that you might find on any law school exam where a transfer that is executed by two parties is not valid for a number of reasons. So maybe the party effecting the transfer, doesn't have the capacity to enter into the agreement. Maybe the agreement is concluded under some form of duress. Maybe you use force to make me sign a, a contract or, in this case, transfer a crypto asset. And so the problem in a fully decentralized system is that we have no way of correcting these transfers. If we have no way of correcting these transfers, then we pretty much need to, if we have no way of correcting this as a way of the implementation of the protocol, then we need to accept whatever transfer has happened, notwithstanding what the law says about the transfer. So we would have to say, for instance, that even if you forced me to transfer the, the asset, the transfer will still be valid. And this is, I think, quite clearly, and I, I discussed that in the paper, something that we as a society are very unlikely to accept and that legislators, for very good reasons, are very unlikely to implement as our rule, any transfer that happens under the rules of the protocol, whenever you sign a transaction, this is irreversible and will stay irreversible. And importantly, for the assets that I talk about, so let's say a share in a corporation, you really do become the shareholder of the company, even though you held a gun to my head when I um, transferred the share. Now, if we won't accept that, then the question is, what can be and what should be the fate of this electronic representation of the share. And I discuss a number of potential fixes. So the first fix I already ruled out, I said we could change the law to say, you know, let's forget about all the restrictions for transfers and for basically contracts and just give effect to the protocol. If we don't want to do that, then we need to introduce some other fix. One fix would be to say, we give the state, we give a judge, for instance, the ability to correct the record of our blockchain protocol. So we have, let's say, a share register that is run on a blockchain, but the implementation of this blockchain is such that the judicial system, for instance, has some sort of a super key. So it does get a privileged position in the network and it can then go back and rectify our share register and say, no, Edmund still is the shareholder because he had no capacity of transferring the share or whatever else the problem might be. Now, I explained that if we are prepared to do this, then the whole implementation of blockchain technology is completely pointless because we now have a system that looks decentralized and comes with all the overheads and problems of a fully decentralized system. And then in the last step, we add a, an element of centralization. And because we add this element of centralization, we then need to ask ourselves, well, if we're prepared to give somebody central control over the ledger, why can't we then just run a normal traditional centralized database to start with. There are other possible fixes to that that have been um, proposed. One possible um, fix that is often discussed is the use of so-called oracles. So people who basically read court decisions and then based on those court decisions, they provide some input that other people will then implement into the blockchain mechanism. They're, it's not really necessary to go into the kind of technical details for that. The problem remains the same. It doesn't really matter what the transmission mechanism is from a judicial decision to the blockchain. The only question that matters is, does our judicial system, does a judge have the power to effectively rectify the system? If the answer is yes, then 
you have a centralized system, however complicated the implementation, and then the complications that you added in order to make it decentralized, unnecessary ballast that you should basically get rid of, or the judge doesn't have this ability, and then you have the problem I described before, namely that the law will not accept the transfer that your protocol still reflects as and has recorded as a valid transfer. And then you have this mismatch between what your ledger says, what the blockchain system says on the one hand, and what the legal system says in relation to the allocation of assets in society. And because the legal system is necessary for enforcement, so in the case of a company, for instance, if under the law a share transfer has not happened, then I am still, despite whatever the blockchain protocol rules say the ledger looks like, I still have the legal entitlement to receive a dividend or to exercise my voting rights or any other right attached to shares. So you then have this mismatch. And if you don't have a system of resynchronizing those two, and in particular, if you don't have a system that matches what the legal system say, then you end up with a useless decentralized ledger, namely one that nobody can rely on because there may always have been some problem at some point up the chain that makes the blockchain asset no longer a real representation, an effective representation of whatever asset you want to have. Now, some have tried to solve this by choice of law clauses, basically saying we just need to find one jurisdiction that comes very close to just saying whatever the blockchain says will be fine. And then once we have this anchor jurisdiction, or um, sometimes the argument is once we convince one legislator somewhere to accept this system, then we can just opt into that law and everything will be fine. And then I explain in the article that even if you could do that, it would not solve the problem because private international law rules pretty much everywhere have restrictions built in that try to avoid this kind of situation where you import a law that would create results that are unacceptable for our legal system. And so we have order of public exceptions and, and so on. And so you would end up not having the result that you try to achieve. For blockchain to find serious use in transactions for non-crypto assets, including physical assets, what would need to happen? Should we even expect that to happen or not? And what would be the legal, political, or other barriers for why uh, we might not expect to see some of these applications emerge? Based on my arguments in the article, I would say that it is unlikely that we will see this implementation work for any blockchain that is truly decentralized for the reasons I just discussed. Does that mean that we will never see any serious blockchain application for physical assets or really any asset that has legal existence, legal reality? The answer is probably no. It may still be the case that we see some of that happen, but the way the blockchain systems work would have to be fairly centralized. And we've seen that, and this has been discussed quite a lot under the title of enterprise blockchain, where the example used sometimes is a number of the large investment banks come together and they form their own blockchain to record the bilateral exposures they have from OTC derivatives trading or something like that. Now, is that possible? Answer is yes, it is possible because in this particular case, if you have a small number of players that are all bound by the legal system and obviously are committed to complying with the legal system, then you can use such a system that records those trades, records those exposures. It could even be used for recording the ownership of physical assets. But the reason this would work is that there's an inherent implicit possibility for these players and also an obligation on the part of these players to rectify the record if something goes really wrong. So if you have somebody making a mistaken transaction or, I don't know, some criminal activity happening, then these players could still come together and rectify that. And they would have an incentive to do so because if any litigation ensues, then obviously the court would order the legal assets 
be that payment streams or whatever else, to match whatever the legal system says, irrespective of what the ledger says. So they would also have this incentive to rectify. Generally speaking, I argue, and I haven't heard any convincing counter argument, there just isn't a good reason for doing it. But that in itself doesn't mean it is unlikely to happen or impossible that it will happen. And we've seen some experiments with that. And one possible explanation for why this could happen is that the general interest in blockchain technology makes it possible for players to come together and create new systems, which is inherently difficult and expensive and so on. And they could do so even if it is an inferior system based on the current enthusiasm around these assets. So you could have this effect where everyone is so excited about the technology that they come up with something that is suboptimal, but still offers advantages over the status quo. And so I discussed that a bit in the paper. The status quo is, of course, not very good, right? If we look at our banking system, if we look at the registration of share ownership across borders and so on, these systems have grown over many, many years, decades, sometimes centuries. And these systems are just not built in the same way that we would build them from scratch. So in a way, the fact that the technology may not offer any real advantages over alternatives doesn't really matter too much as long as it is for some, in my view, fairly irrational reason, an incentive or kickstarts a coordinated rebuilding of some infrastructure. And the blockchain element here would really be just being the catalyst for coordination, the catalyst for harmonization and ensuring that the compatibility between different systems exists. It would not be the technology itself, but you could say the psychological effects it has. What key takeaways would you like listeners to have from this conversation and from the article? I think the key takeaway from my perspective is that we should be very skeptical about the proposed uses of the technology and what I would see as kind of magical thinking around these blockchain applications. When you read industry publications, but often also materials produced by very well-known large banks, other institutions, advisors, you can get the impression that there's something new and inherently revolutionary around this technology that will allow us to do things differently, that will revolutionize our economy. It's really worth drilling down a bit and looking at what the technology actually can and what it cannot do. And I suggest a sober view of blockchain technology and its promise. And I also explain, and I think that's perhaps practically speaking, the most important takeaway for most people. I explain why these promises of the technology often sound so revolutionary, so promising, so great. And my answer to that puzzle is that they always get the comparator wrong. So when you read about what we could do with blockchain technology, the typical way this is presented is by comparing what we currently have, so the imperfect status quo that I described earlier, to a state of the world where everyone switches without any switching costs, without any argument about the new standards and so on, to this new technology. And if you compare these two states of the world, then it will always be the case that the blockchain world looks much more efficient, much more promising. But I try to explain that this would be the case for any harmonized new system that we build and that it's just wrong to compare the status quo with a particular application that requires everyone to change the way they're doing things from today to tomorrow. And that the right comparator is assuming that you can get everyone to accept your new proposed system, to adopt your new way of doing things. Among all the possible solutions, among all the possible implementations of that new system, what is the best one? And I believe I show that for 
all applications that have a connection to the law for all assets that have legal reality and existence, blockchain technology is not the winner in that right comparison. Our guest today has been Edmund Schuster, Associate Professor of Corporate Law at the London School of Economics. We discussed his article, Cloud Crypto Land, which is forthcoming in the Modern Law Review. I'll link to the article in the show notes for the episode. Edmund, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Andrew. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.